it's busy. It's building. New factories are going up with the assurance they carry of increased prosperity. New homes are under command of new families moving in. It's a barometer of confidence in the future of my town. A confidence that comes from knowing its many advantages. The excellent schools, for example, that serve their children and the playgrounds available for recreation. Comforting to the happy fathers and mothers who live here and call it home. For my town is home in the pleasantest sense of the word. From the early call of the milkman, through a day of normal activities, one gets the feeling that this is a community of good neighbors. The kind of a place you'd like to live in perhaps grow old in. The kind of a place you'd take pride in, that a great many people take pride in. That's my town. What's making it all tick? What's welding it into a going community? Many things, of course. But one of the most essential factors in its growth is communications. Communications provided by the telephone company and designed, among other things, to give my town the means for transacting business, the means for communicating information, for seeking help, for keeping old friends in touch. Yes, communications and the telephone company that provides them are part of every community in America, the welding force that joins them into a nation of neighborhoods, communicating with each other, and with every country of the world. And like my town itself, the telephone company is more than buildings and vehicles, poles and switchboards. It's people, many people in many places, doing many different jobs. Like the operators who handle telephone calls in my town. Here in the central office, you can feel the pulse of the community. The flashing lights on the switchboard reflect the activity of the town. Thank you. It begins to stir in the early hours of the morning. Your name and number? It reaches its peak in the rush hours of daytime. That's Pennsylvania place, please. Thank you. And then settles back for the night. It's the job of the traffic department to handle this changing volume of calls. It has to be ready with enough equipment and enough operators, 24 hours a day, to meet the customer's demands for service. From the earliest days of her training, every operator learns to think of her job in terms of service to the community. This is information. May I help you? Yes, I'd like the new number of Wilson's Meat Market. 1191 Sycamore Street, please. One moment, please. The number is right 56240. Right 56240. Thank you. You're welcome. Operator. In addition to supplying information, operators put through all kinds of calls, many of them to out of town points near and far. And for each call they handle, they record the facts needed to accurately bill the customer. The calling number, the place called, and length of the conversation are all noted for use by the accounting department. Sometimes, an operator handles calls that are more urgent than others. Operator? Operator, there's been a bad accident. Two cars head on. Please get a doctor and an ambulance. Can you give me the address, please? It's right outside my house, Old Woods Road near Van Dyke. Hurry, please. Thank you. We'll get help to you as fast as possible. Thank you. The telephone operator's tradition of staying on the job in times of disaster is well known. It's a responsibility they willingly accept and take pride in. Whether the call be emergency or routine, 
the operator performs a service that is vital to the business and social life of every thriving community in the nation. And that certainly fits my town. It's a community on the go. New shopping areas to keep pace with demand. New construction of all kinds. New factories are going up, creating greater job opportunities with all that they hold for my town and its people. Homes are being built to house the increasing population of workers and their families. They all need communications, and the telephone company has to be ready to supply them. Connecting these new telephones is the job of telephone installers. Each morning, they gather at the plant work center to get the day's assignments from their installation supervisor. Hi, Ted. Hi. Your first day, huh? That's right. Well, I guess these will keep you busy. Better start with this new installation for John Gardner, 406 Melrose. Say, how did things go down to plant school? Well, I think I learned a lot, but uh, I'll feel better when this first day is over. <laughs> OK, Ted. I'll stop in later and see how you're getting along. All right, see ya. Hi. Hi. This your house? Yep. Could you tell me something? Uh, sure, if I can. Where does this wire go? Well, you see, this is a telephone wire. And it's going to run from your house to the big cable on top of that pole. How come it's so big on the pole and so little down here? That cable's got about 100 wires inside of it, and each one of them connects to a phone in somebody's home or office. The cable then travels from pole to pole until it reaches our central office, where all the little wires are connected to switching equipment. The switching equipment completes the phone calls automatically, or sends them to the operator. Then your phones will be ready for service. That is, they will be as soon as I hook them up. Well, I'm on my way to the store. So long. So long, son. I'll have them hooked up by the time you get back. My, it looks just fine. Your phones are ready, Mrs. Gardner. Right now, you can call anywhere in the world if you want to. Good. And uh, here's your new directory. Your name will appear in the next issue. Meantime, people can find you through information. Well, thank you. It's so nice to have a telephone. Hi, Ted. Hi. How's it going, boy? Just fine. Have any trouble on the job? Nothing special. But I did have a youngster asking me some questions. And they got me thinking. I install phones, and uh, I know all the steps. Well, that's part of my plant training. But where do the other departments come in? I mean, how do they fit in the act? Well, I guess that's a natural question for a newcomer, Ted. You're curious, and you should be, about how your job fits in with others in the company. Well, it's kind of a big order, Ted. But I can tell you this. All of us in the telephone company are organized to do just one thing, to give people good telephone service. Now, to do that and do it right takes a lot of people with a lot of different skills. Now, I know you've been through this at the plant school, but let's just review it. Say there's a new family, uh, like the gardeners here, move to my town and want telephone service. Chances are someone in the family goes to the telephone office and puts in an order. Or the order could be telephoned in. Either way, it's handled by one of our service representatives in the commercial department. The service rep makes the customer feel at home, gets the name and address, and how the name is to be listed in the directory. You see, she wants to be sure the customer gets complete telephone service. These days, homes have telephones wherever it's convenient. And that's as it should be. They want their extensions where they'll be of most value. It could be indoors, say the bedroom, or outdoors on a terrace. And we installers can be of help. For instance, 
you'll find that you have lots of chances to suggest locations for telephones while you're working. It's all part of doing a good job. But let's get back to Mrs. Gardner's request for service, right? Now, once the order is placed, Commercial goes right to work on it. First off, a copy of the order with all the details is sent to the plant department. There, a clerk assigns the necessary facilities to do the job, including central office lines and outside equipment. Simultaneously, directory, traffic, and accounting people receive identical copies of the order so they can prepare their records for the new customer. The planned installation copy of that order comes to me, and I assign the work to you fellows each morning. Now, while you were hooking up the line for Mrs. Gardner's phone, the frame man in the central office was connecting it to the switching equipment. That gives us the circuit that makes it possible for Mrs. Gardner to pick up her phone and call to a friend across town, or across the nation. Well, that's part of the story, Ted. Lots more, of course. But maybe it's given you some little background on how a few of the departments work together. It sure helps, Jack. But boy, I've got a lot to learn, haven't I? We've all got a lot to learn, Ted. You never stop learning in this business. And you understand your own job better when you know how other departments operate. For instance, the commercial department. In addition to servicing new customers, such as Mrs. Gardner, also handles the payments of the customer's bills. It has the further responsibility of forwarding the names of new subscribers to the printer for the telephone directory. Every name, address, and number is carefully checked and rechecked for absolute accuracy. It is an exacting task every step of the way. As they say, it's something for the book. The book, in this case, being the most widely used volume of the year. Commercial also collects the money from public telephones that serve my town in stores, factories, transportation centers, and even along the highways. Then there are the telephone salesmen. They have the job of calling on business customers and suggesting the type of telephone system that will best serve the customer's business needs. Directory advertising salesmen also call on business customers and show how Yellow Pages advertising can help them. They plan the kind of layouts that attract buyers and boost sales for the advertiser. The service the telephone people give can be as immediate as right now. It can seek and answer the needs of today. It can plan the needs of tomorrow. And the needs of tomorrow are a service responsibility of the engineers. They have the job of looking ahead, of anticipating how and where my town is going to grow. So the telephone plan can be installed efficiently and economically and be ready when the customer needs it. They decide where telephone cable will be installed, how it will be installed, underground or overhead, and how much of it will be needed. Should it be a 200-pair cable or a 400-pair cable? They have to make sure there's enough equipment in the central office to handle the switching of the calls and plan cables for routing long-distance calls. The engineers also work directly with builders in my town to be sure the telephone service will be ready for customers when they move into their new homes. Uh, houses run twenty dollars to $25,000, and I've got the men out working and figure to have them finished by spring. In other words, you want to be ready for immediate telephone installation when the houses are completed. Definitely. Well, here's the situation, Mr. Palmer. We've got enough feeder cable coming up to this area, but we've still got to get our poles and distribution cables in place for wiring to the houses. I had no idea there was so much involved. Well, that's why we appreciate this advance notice. You know, uh, some builders don't include us in their plans, and then the new homeowners have to wait for their telephones. We don't want that to happen here. We want phones available when our houses go up. You can count on us. We'll be ready. In just such fashion, telephone planning and construction work go hand in hand as my town grows and expands. Poles 
are set. Cable strung. Terminals go in. A communication pattern develops that serves the growing needs of my town. And to give my town the top telephone service it needs and expects takes a lot of money. And that's where accounting comes in. It has to keep track of all the money spent and received so that the company may know where it stands financially. All bills and invoices come to accounting for checking. And they keep all the cost records necessary to prepare the company's financial reports. They have charge of the records that document the location, the type, and the size of telephone plant. And here, too, are prepared the paychecks, an event of never-failing interest to every employee of the company. Accounting also prepares and mails the customer's bills. And there's more to that than the mere say-so. An array of data processing equipment handles a customer's bill from the first step of listing the customer's name and address through the successive stages of computing the bill and preparing it for mailing. Telephones are bringing people together. Bradford's Jewelry? May I speak to Mr. Bradford, please? Thank you, Mrs. Chase. I'll have the order over in about an hour. Hi. Going to the dance? My town gym. Sure. Arnold speaking. Why, hello, Pete. How's things in my town? Things are pretty good in my town. There's a sense of growing prosperity, growing pride, growing happiness. And the telephone company is a grateful participant. Now, we've seen the parts played by the various operating departments, such as traffic, whose operators handle many of the calls. Plant, which installs and maintains the equipment. Engineering, where all the planning and designing are done. Commercial, which is responsible for many customer services. And finally, accounting, where all the financial records are prepared. Working in support of these operating units are the company's staff departments, such as personnel. Personnel helps to develop and train people in all levels of employment. They handle benefit and pension plans, pleasant reminders of earlier days. They also watch over the health of the employees and arrange for medical attention whenever they need it. An equally important staff section is the legal department, which checks all company contracts and represents the company in court actions. Public relations is also one of the company staff departments. It is largely responsible for keeping the public informed about the company. Its members write news releases for the community newspapers. They also prepare newspaper advertisements that promote various telephone services. And they coordinate activities that deal with radio or television shows. They prepare films and other programs for employee and public groups. And they take part in arranging telephone open houses to which the people of the community are invited. The preparation of the company magazine is also the responsibility of public relations. Well, Mike, we've had our problems in putting this together, but there have been many excellent comments. That's the reassuring part of it, Mr. Bolton. Now I think we've reached the point where we need a good story to wrap the whole thing up. Now, I have some ideas I'd like to talk over with you. Good. Let's see now. The previous articles have covered all phases of our company's operations. That's correct. 
And now that we've explained what we do, I think we should show how we fit into the big picture. How we're backed up by AT&T, Western Electric, and the Bell Labs. AT&T, Western Electric, Bell Telephone Laboratories. Magic names in communications the world over. Let's start with AT&T, the parent company which coordinates the activities and policies of all the companies in the system. Each of the operating companies serves a specific area of the United States and Canada. Each has its own duties and responsibilities, but all work closely with AT&T, which provides advice and assistance whenever needed. Within its own territory, each operating company supplies local and long distance service. And AT&T, through its long lines department, connects each company with the other, uniting them into an integrated system. Long Lines also connects the Bell system with the thousands of independent telephone companies. In effect, it furnishes the links that make nationwide telephone service possible. It builds and operates the radio relay towers that carry calls across the continent. It supervises the laying of underwater cables that enable people to call across the seas. And although many people aren't aware of it, Long Lines also provides the channels that radio and television broadcasters use for their nationwide networks. Western Electric is an equally important partner of the Bell system. It serves as the system's manufacturing arm. And from its plants throughout the country come the millions and millions of telephones that the Bell companies require to serve a growing nation. Western also produces the vast amounts of cable that are needed to interconnect all these telephones. And it builds and installs the dial switching equipment and switchboards used in most central offices. In addition to manufacturing cable and communication equipment, Western also serves as the supplier for the entire Bell system. This means that the companies not only depend on it for their telephone apparatus, but also their other everyday supplies, such as paper clips, typewriter ribbon, and anything else they need. Naturally, Western Electric doesn't make all these things itself. As a matter of fact, most of the items are purchased from more than 33,000 industrial firms across the country. From its warehouses strategically located over the nation, Western Electric is able to rush communications equipment to any stricken area in times of emergency. This equipment is so standardized that crewmen brought from any operating company of the Bell system can use it without further instruction. This assures efficient and rapid restoration of service. Then there is the extremely important part that both Western Electric and the Bell Telephone Laboratories are playing in building the nation's military defense system. Both have had much to do in the design and construction of such projects as the Dew Line and SAGE, and in the development and manufacture of guided missiles. Telephone Laboratories is the research and development partner in the Bell system. It is one of the largest and most experienced industrial laboratories in the world. And it is uniquely qualified to do the design work for both military and civilian communications equipment. Its job is to provide America with the communications of the future, as it has already designed the communications of the present. The laboratory's modern research centers are staffed by scientists and engineers planning years ahead, searching, designing, seeking new knowledge and new understanding. Their aim is to continually develop better tools and equipment to improve telephone service, and to do it in such a way as to assure efficient and economic operation. The achievements of Bell Laboratories researchers are many, 
ranging through all branches of the communications field. One of their latest advances in telephone progress is leading to new systems of automatically switching telephone calls. These systems are so radical in design that they promise to bring tomorrow's customers a multitude of almost undreamed of services. The tiny device which will make these electronic switching systems possible is the revolutionary transistor. Invented at the laboratories, the transistor brought Bell scientists one of the two Nobel Prizes they have won for discoveries in physics. Though it was primarily developed for the betterment of telephone communications, the versatile transistor now appears in a staggering variety of devices and equipment. It has become an important factor in the growth of many new industries, a development that is welcomed by the telephone company. Welcome because it is in the pattern of service that is traditional with every phase of telephone operation. From its very beginning, service has been an inseparable part of the telephone story. As inseparable as the telephone company's long and continuing association with the communities of America. The My Towns everywhere who gave it the opportunity to be of service. They have grown together, these cities and villages of America and their telephone companies. Good friends and good neighbors. They share the responsibilities of good citizenship. Telephone people are proud of those responsibilities, both on the job and as individual citizens helping their communities in their own ways. They are proud of being part of their town's hopes and joys. Proud of being able to further its communications, whatever the hour. Proud and happy to be of service.